Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the final uh, DBMI seminar session for this semester. Uh, today, we have one of our own, uh, Kang Gyu, uh, presenting. He's an associate research scientist in the department. Oh, hi there. Um, and uh, his research resides in the areas oh, of that, uh... and informatics tools innovation. Uh, his research focuses on developing and applying novel informatics methods for genetic disorders, diagnosis, and risk prediction, as well as facilitating the implementation of genomic medicine using the electronic health record systems. Dr. Liu uh, received his BS in biological science from the Fudan University, MS in math from University of Illinois at Chicago, and PhD in bioinformatics as well from UIC. He later joined Columbia and completed his both postdoctoral uh, training right here in the department. And with that, uh, I leave it to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Harry, for the very nice introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I will say good morning if you are from the West Coast. I'm not sure because, you know, if anything I learned from the past few years about Zoom meeting is that never assume everyone in the Zoom meeting is from the same time Zooms. Uh, this is, you know, especially some lessons I learned from this eMERGE network because we have sites from West Coast. We also have sites from the East Coast. You know, that's why we have meetings scheduled always in the noon and the afternoon, I guess, to accommodate people from the West Coast. Uh, so the talk today I'm going to give is the eMERGE, uh, Genomic Risk Assessment and Management Network. Uh, before I start, I would like to do a very quick survey. How many of you have heard about eMERGE? You know, can you just raise your hand? Great. Oh, okay, this uh, physical way about raising hands. I saw a lot of physical way to raising hand, but oh well, that's quite quite good. You know, half and half. I will say. Uh, um, so nothing to disclose. Uh, this one I consider this as a failed Microsoft AI example. Uh, I don't know what about you guys have this kind of experience, but every time when I type EHR, I get this HER returned back by the very intelligent Microsoft AI, uh, which I, I, I consider, you know, basically is uh, not a good example of AI implementation. Uh, essentially, you want AI to give you suggestions and recommendations or at least warnings, but here basically AI make decision for you, for human beings. But anyway, you know, uh, uh, the, the thing is, you know, I, I'm, I, when I have this eMERGE, which is the electronic medical records and genomics, I always think, you know, uh, why it is called electronic medical records, because I, I used to call it electronic health record, but in eMERGE, it is called electronic medical records. So I guess one thing is you want to have a very nice acronym, because otherwise you will get eMERGE, which sounds like, you know, kind of bizarre, right? And uh, something I learned in the past few years is, you know, you always have some very nice acronym, you know, in, in your profile project or, you know, even actually, I guess the, the most of impress, impressive acronyms I have heard is from the, the bills introduced or passed by the Congress. So those green, hero, uh, care, those bill, you know, they all has, has a very sound and impressive acronym. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I found this, this is very interesting uh, to me. Uh, there's a bill which actually introduced in 2015 called the Accountability and the Congressional Responsibility on name, Naming Your Motion, which is Acronym Act. Uh, the, the introduce of this bill actually is to prohibit the addition of a war, words to the title of a bill that just to create an acronym. But unfortunately, even I mean, a, a bill to prevent this or prohibit too, too, too many wrong use of acronym, have this acronym in the bill name. Uh, so essentially, you know, I guess eMERGE want to have electronic medic records, you know, for a very nice acronym. But I also did my homework to compare the eMERGE and the EHR. Uh, essentially, this is some lessons I learned when I do this kind of prepare, uh, this you know, seminar preparation. I learned actually EMR is a, just an old, old fashioned way to represent EHR, which is, you know, some digital version of paper. Chart cannot be shared, cannot be moved around. 
Uh, instead, if EHR is something you know more advanced, which can be shared, can be moved around, uh, which in nature, by nature, have this ability to support medical decision. And I guess because eMERGE, this project is pretty old, uh, 2007. So now it's already 18 years old, uh, 15 years old, I'm sorry. Uh, so I guess at that time it's old. So EMR is still the mainstream. So that's probably another reason it was called e e eMERGE. But uh, if you have any other thoughts and ideas about why it is called eMERGE, feel free to write me an email. I'm glad to learn. Uh, so that that's just some warm up and uh, the objectives of this talk, actually, uh, there are three folds. First, uh, I'm going to introduce eMERGE resource. It's all about data, right? Um, researchers like data, and especially in our department, everyone like data. And uh, I get emails uh, from others, from, from uh, the folks in the department ask me, so what exactly do we have in eMERGE? And another question is, how can we get access to the eMERGE data, right? Uh, this is something quite interesting, and I would like to take this opportunity to just formally introduce eMERGE resources. So the second aim of this talk is to introduce the current eMERGE study, including the study design, PRS, and EHR integrations. The third aim, actually, uh, I was here, I'm here uh, with a task from the recruitment team. So in this phase of eMERGE, we are going to uh, recruit a prospective cohort. So, you know, I'm going to advocate it to some advertisement. Try us. Uh, the primary goal of the eMERGE network, uh, as the name suggested, you know, uh, is to develop, disseminate, and apply approach to research that combine biobanks uh, with EMR or EHR uh, to large scale high throughput genetic research in support of implementing genomic medicine. So, I guess here, one keyword is implementing, so uh, which make it slightly different from other, you know, biobank related study. That is, we also want to explore the clinical implementation of genomic medicine in this eMERGE network. And that's why the consortium have a specific focus on LC social ethnical issues, such as privacy, confidential, and interactions with the broader community. Uh, I would like to go through some history about eMERGE. So funded on 2007, uh, the first phase running until 2011, the aim of the first phase is to explore the possibility of linking EMR or EHR with DNA biorepository or biobank. And one thing is, you know, using the eMERGE to test the feasibility of conducting GWAS using the EMR uh, by implementing phenotyping algorithms. Because traditionally, well, I, I won't say actually traditionally, it's more like Asian way of doing GWAS is you recruit two different cohorts. One is uh, case and another is control. And then you do the genotyping, you do the GWAS analysis, right? But uh, in eMERGE or other biobank related kind of similar study, we start with recruitment from the EHR. We don't really define case control ahead of time. That is until we recruit them and we do the genotyping, we, we are going to using the EHR to redefine the case and control status by implementing developing phenotyping algorithms. So phenotyping always is a very important topic uh, or research questions in the eMERGE network. So the phase two running from 2011 to 2015 uh, is, con is going to continue, was going to continue doing the GWAS and phenotyping algorithm development. Uh, there's you know, uh, one important part is there's a pilot to incorporate genomic variants back into EMR for clinical use. So this is a typical important uh, implementation uh, example in the eMERGE network. So we want to bring those uh, uh, novel discoveries back into EMR to help the clinical care. Also in phase two, there's an initialization about, uh, of the pharmacogenomic studies called eMERGE PGX project. So eMERGE 3 run from 2015 to 2020. 19, uh, that's when Columbia joined the eMERGE 3 project. Uh, besides continuing the GWAS and uh, develop more advanced phenotyping algorithms, there's an important project in eMERGE 3 that is eMERGE Seek project. So in this eMERGE Seek project, uh, 
we basically assess the clinical import implications of some rare variants uh, in clinically relevant genes. Uh, and also, I will, I will describe this image seek project later, but uh, another important part of image 3 uh, as the, you know, always about this network is to create a community resource and share the lessons uh, across the uh, broader research communities. Uh, so now we are in eMERGE 4. Uh, I, the second part of my presentation today will talk more details about this eMERGE 4 project. So after review this history, you know, this is a network studies. There are many sites, historical, some of them are historical sites, Geisinger, uh, Kaiser, uh, those are eMERGE 3 sites, but they left. Uh, they, they are not included in eMERGE 4. Uh, Columbia, we joined at eMERGE 3, and we are likely to be one of the sites at eMERGE 4. UAB is a new site of eMERGE 4. So this is something I would like to remind everyone, you know, the data set we connected is a dynamic data, data set, you know, reflecting this kind of, you know, dynamic change of clinical sites. Uh, this is a map of the eMERGE 4 uh, network. Uh, we have clinical sites from both West Coast and East Coast. Uh, many sites on the East Coast, only one site actually <laughs> from the West Coast. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, once I remember Patrick Ryan told me, you know, the good thing to work on the East Coast is, you know, you can always have the meeting scheduled on the same time zone. You don't need to wake up at five o'clock in the morning to attend an NIH meeting scheduled at eight in the morning. Uh, so I guess we have more clinical sites on the East Coast. Uh, besides those clinical sites, uh, who, which is going to recruit patients and uh, in charge of returning results to the participants, there are also some data coordinate centers uh, represented by those triangles. One is the uh, Vanderbilt site, uh, that's a uh, uh, coordinate center for recruitment and data coordination. And we also have Broad Institute uh, in charge of genome typing. Um, there's Invitae, uh, which is a commercial company, is going to do the sequencing for this image for site cycle. Uh, we have four PIs, uh, and two of them are here. I saw Chenghua and George uh, for the for image four at Columbia. Uh, and also we have Wendy Chang, uh, who is a professor of pediatrics, uh, who had who, who chief the division of clinical genetics. We also have Christoph, uh, an associate pro professor of nephro nephrology. So why I am here, I asked myself this question. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the reason I'm here to do this kind of presentation is I give myself, I self-appointed myself a role as the spokesman for Emerge 4 at Columbia. But, uh, you know, I saw Chunghua and George is here. You are here. If you think, you know, I should not be the spokesman, feel free to let me know. Just let me know. I am fired. I'm totally fine with that. You are very much appreciated. Thank you for being the spokesman. Thank you, boss. So. Uh, the first part, uh, data, you know, I guess this is one of the reasons most of you might want to pay most of attention here. And the first thing first, let's talk about data. So overall, what have been generated and maintained for the image, you know, from image one to image three. Genomics, you know, this obviously. Uh, we have image one to three imputed data sets uh, that contains 100,000 individuals. We have eMERGE sequencing data set. eMERGE sequencing data set was generated on eMERGE 3, as you remember in the history slides. So that contains 25,000 individuals. We also have some historical uh, data sets. That's PGX data set, uh, whole, exon, whole exon sequencing and whole genome sequencing data set donated by uh, different sites. Uh, besides genomics, oh, okay. There's also uh, something yet to come. That is, we are going to do genotyping on this phase of eMERGE, eMERGE 4, we are going to genotyping 25,000 in addition for eMERGE 4. Uh, besides geno genomics, we also have phenotyping data sets. Uh, for phenotyping data sets, we collected common variables from the EHR for around 100,000 individuals, including ICD-CPD codes and other labs. Uh, we developed pretty plenty you know, phenotype algorithms. Uh, well, but as I said, you know, we have this phenotyping algorithms developed across the, you know, all, all years. So the, the, the number of individuals have phenotyping algorithms uh, really depends on when this phenotyping algorithms was implemented. 
Uh, this is a slide showing the data count breakdown by sites on Emerge 3. Uh, as you can see, well, uh, the first column, uh, the second column, that is Emerge 1 and Emerge 3 merge the data set. We have Columbia, which only have uh, 2000 data set. That is because we joined Emerge uh, 3 phase. We don't have data on Emerge 1 and Emerge 2. So that, that is when we can, you know, for sure take advantage of other sites. For example, Chop, uh, Harvard, uh, North, you know, uh, Vanderbilt, they have much more genotyping data sets, but, uh, you know, we, 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 it is a good opportunity for us to take advantage of them. Uh, but uh, we did donate some data sets that is whole exon sequencing for uh, eMERGE, uh, thanks to Wendy. So this is a whole exon sequencing related to pediatric cardi cardiac patients. And the last column is about the eMERGE seq data set. Uh, essentially, we have this uh, sites who is in, uh, eMERGE 3 data set have you know, each size have around 2,500 to 3,000 individuals sequenced uh, in the image seek uh, project. Uh, so first data sets and probably the most important data sets, largest data set is this image one to three imputed data sets, which contains around 100,000 individuals. Uh, there are 40 million variants available in this data sets. Uh, this data set is collected by merging image one, two, three data sets from 12 contributed uh, medical centers. Uh, so essentially, you know, because this is collected along the time from different sites. So we will have this many uh, genotyping array batch. There are in total 78 uh, genotyping array batches. So uh, in this image three, there's a main act, uh, activity is to use the Michigan imputation server uh, using the Minimax three imputation algorithm to impute variants uh, using the HRC as a reference. So eventually once we create this uh, imputed, imputed data set, we can do a principal component analysis and uh, this uh, visualization of the first of PCs, uh, which is you know informative for uh, for the ancestry different color essentially means different ancestry. You can see uh, the first pre, uh, two components can you know pretty good separate uh, individuals into different ancestry. Green essentially are those uh, Europeans and blues are, are African Americans and the pink or red are Asian samples. Uh, so. Essentially, we have two parts. One is self-reported demographics, and also we have this uh, genome-informed ancestry. Uh, I would like to remind all of you, if you want to using this imputed data set, is this self-reported dem demographics? As we all know, they extracted from the EHR, so they suffer from the you know mi missingness and the errors. So when you really want to incorporate the ancestry or you know this demographic information, it is good to using the uh, genotyping-informed uh, ancestry. To, to set this uh, uh, ancestry specific analysis. The second data set I, I'm going to introduce is this image sequencing data set, image seq, uh, so which contains 25,000 samples. Uh, this is not a whole genome sequencing data set. Uh, essentially, there's a panel of gene was selected by uh, the committee, uh, which included inclu 56 from ACMG actionable finding list and uh, also uh, a few sites nominated by each different sites, clinical sites. Uh, eventually there are around 1500 single nuclear variant sites available uh, in this panel. Uh, most of them are actually, you know, uh, variants with unknown significance, BUS so-called. So after we conduct this panel sequencing, a major question uh, we want to ask is, uh, what is the penetrance of breast, uh, you know, the variants by gene, and for example, this is a study led by Fan uh, Xiao Fan at Columbia uh, to investigate the penetrance of you know uh, breast cancer variants uh, by those suspected genes. And for those who are not familiar with this term, penetrance, essentially, you know, if you are from uh, computer science or if you're familiar with the machine learning, penetrance is somehow you know you can interpret it similarly as PPV. Uh, positive predict value or precision. Uh, essentially, is disease risk in carriers of the risk allele. For example, here uh, you have this uh, BRAC2 uh, gene. Uh, if, 
if you have any uh, risk allele carrier in this BRAC2 gene, the percentage of the individuals who, who is going to develop to breast cancer by age of eight, uh, 70 is uh, around 20%. So, you know, this is like a precision, but uh, you will say, okay, precision 20% is pretty low, but uh, considering the general population, uh, uh, you know, a uh, risk uh, preference of breast cancer by age, by, by age of 70 is around 8%. This is pretty high, almost, you know, two or three folds higher in the BRAC2 example. Uh, so that's when, you know, we talk about machine learning as, you know, we, we aim pretty high precision like 80 or 70%, but uh, in real case in the implementation, sometimes 30% is pretty good considering the general you know, preference is so low, right? And here's an, another example uh, uh, published by Andrew on 2022 that using the image data to estimate the penetrance of uh, arrhythmia variance by gene. Uh, one thing I would like to point out here is if you look at the first bar uh, that is MA, that, it, that, that represents uh, the percentage of affected individuals uh, without any carrier of the risk alleles. So you will see this 25% is pretty high. Yes, I think it's very high. The reason, again, is remember we are using the eMERGE, using the, I mean, I'm sorry, using the EHR, EMR to recruit the patients. So essentially EMR, patients with long EMR, those are sicker patients. So by nature, they will have a pretty high percentage of affected individuals. But, uh, you know, what is the background percentage uh, or, you know, uh, the percentage of, uh, you know, preference of uh, arrhythmia in the general population, that will be totally different. So that's another thing, you know, I would like to remind you why you want to using this data set, always keep in mind, you know, those individuals are recruited in the EHR. Those can represent sicker patients in general. Uh, phenotyping. So, for three, over the three years, we have developed uh, 82 phenotyping algorithms. Uh, those phenotyping algorithms, you know, usually have the same life circle, uh, first developed by a primary site and also reviewed by the primary sites. And then uh, an external so-called secondary site will independently validate, implement, validate this phenotyping algorithm uh, manually. And once, you know, a reasonable high PPV was uh, reached, uh, then, you know, this phenotyping algorithm will be disseminated and implemented by the other sites. So this implementation, again, you know, is something always being ignored. But, uh, you know, in, in the real case, development and validation is always, you know, something like the super step. But uh, in, the, in, in the real research, when this implementation will take a lot of work as well. Uh, so here I would like to uh, give a shout out to our uh, DBMI alumni, uh, Dr. Ningsham Sunny, who, is, who was leading the charge of developing, well, actually implementing this 82 phenotyping algorithms at Columbia. Uh, that's a lot of efforts, you know, implementation. Actually, you know, uh, Ning and me, we both, uh, we together published a paper on 2019, uh, which essentially we identified many, you know, 20 tests involved uh, in this phenotyping implementation task, which you know, can involve knowledge conversion, clouds interpretation and programming. And we assess the time consumption of these different tasks. Uh, essentially, uh, some of those tasks can be you know, improved. The efforts of the, those tasks can be reduced by uh, implementing uh, uh, using a, a OMAP CDM or other kind of CDM. And uh, George published this paper in uh, 2019. That is, you know, uh, ass uh, assess how you know uh, CDM can facilitate the uh, implementation of phenotyping algorithms in a network study. Uh, but uh, there's still some, you know, uh, some some algorithms which, especially when it can, uh, involved in natural language processing, you won't be able to disseminate uh, easily implement this using the OMAP CDM. Uh, we, besides the phenotyping algorithm, we also have the common variables collected, uh, including demographics, ICD-CPT codes, BMI, vital signs, and uh, some selected labs and selected medications. Uh, the next question, you know, uh, for whoever who is techie here, and you know, you want to know what is the data format and the availability, right? Uh, so the genomic data is available as BCF files. Uh, 
we have all network samples merged into one BCF files and this BCF files was then split by chromosomes. And I would like to remind you that this is very large. You know, the overall uh, image one, three merged imputed data set is around 1.5 tagbase. Uh, so always keep that in mind when you want to get access to that data. Uh, the image sequencing data set is not that large. Uh, it's relatively small considering uh, only a, a panel of gene was sequencing the, and the, the, the individuals is not that large. We also have phenotypic data available as plain files. Uh, but the, remember, because the dynamic nature of the sites uh, joined and lift, so the, the you know, latest data might be different. Uh, 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 the availability of the latest data might be different for different individuals. Uh, some sites, uh, you know, emerge four sites basically will have the latest data available up to June 2021, but some historical sites may only have uh, data available up to September 2019. Uh, besides the phenotyping, uh, the common data variable, we also have the phenotyping uh, data, case and control available in uh, PKB and uh, REC accounts. Uh, besides this, we are going to recently uh, working on collecting a set of gold standard data set. Uh, that is, you know, those individuals who have been reviewed uh, across, you know, along the years. So we want to put a gold standard label for those individuals. So hopefully this uh, gold standard data set can serve as a uh, uh, serve as a, a gold standard for supervised machine learning tasks in the future. So this is how the image one, two, three imputed data set looks like split by the chromosome. Uh, although every each each one is already uh, compressed, the data set is still large. So my suggestion is you you should always develop the analysis pipeline uh, using one chromosome and then later expand it to the whole data set. This is an example of common data variables. Uh, you have the first column of uh, image ID, which are the identified. So this is the image ID assigned by the, uh, uh, by the image network. So the first two digits represent the site, uh, 23. And then the second column is the age of the diagnosis. The third column is the ID codes and the last column is either IC9 or 10. This is a, an example of phenotype case control file. So again, the first column is subject ID. And this is an example of case control for CKD algorithm and also case control for uh, cerv cervical intro epithelial neoplasia. So you will have this NA, you know, a lot of NA actually in this file because, you know, not all, again, not all individuals will have this uh, phenotyping algorithm implemented uh, in all sites. Uh, Next, I, I guess probably this is one of the most important slides. Uh, how are we going to get access to the data? You want to ask this question. So my answer is you have to take an e EKG uh, so that you can get the access of the data, uh, which obviously is just an unfunny joke, uh, which this, this right-hand side figure is uh, suggested again by the Microsoft AI called uh, design ideas. I don't know, uh, have you ever noticed this? I just recently noticed this and I find pretty funny. So I include this figure here, just take the suggestion by the AI. And uh, if you feel uh, not interested to access the data, you know, feel free to play with this one now. But if you are interested to get, uh, to get getting access of the data, uh, it is time for you to draft a letter or speak to PIs, uh, Chenghua or George, uh, you know, either of them is fine. Uh, or if you want to write to uh, Christoph and Wendy, also, you know, you can do that. But uh, if you don't want to speak to bosses, you want to speak to me, if you're comfortable, uh, then just speak to me, I can help. Uh, one thing I would like to remind you, uh, yes, um, you know, uh, because this is a network study. So if you want to publish, you need to submit a manuscript concept sheet uh, if you are going to leveraging uh, multiple site data. Uh, but my suggestion is, you know, you can always wait until you feel ready to publish and submit this, uh, you know, manuscript concept sheet. Basically, it's just, a, just like an abstract thing. Okay, uh, I guess I will stop here uh, to take any questions, if you have any, because this, you know, basically, I think it's pretty important about data access. Do we have any questions?
If can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, we, we do have questions. Uh, um, my question is, um, how long does it take? Do we need to do any IRB or anything, or is it just like a like how we do the DB gap access? We just write a project and then get access. Oh, Gamzi, I didn't recognize your voice. Okay, good to hear you again. Uh, so I think Chunghua and George will speak that better, but uh, my understanding is you don't really need to uh, submit a new IRB. So you need to be added to the to an existing IRB. For sure, you have to you know show you, you conducted all the required training, you know, human subject to require, uh, related HIPAA related trainings. But then, you know, once, uh, you know, there's an existing IRB there and uh, we can add you to the existing IRB. Can, can we download, our, um, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Can we download it to our servers or there is a you know cloud environment that we have to use to, to work on the data? Uh, so I will speak for Emerge 3 because Emerge 4 is a different story. Emerge 4, uh, which we do have the plan to have everything on the cloud. Uh, well, actually not everything, but at least for the genomic data uh, on the cloud, but for the historical data Emerge 3, uh, currently, we have data actually on the server. So remember, again, it's quite large. Uh, so we need to figure out a way, you know, how to, you know, get access to data and how to use those data. But for Emerge 4, um, we do have that plan right now. There's going to be an Envil Cloud implementation so that you can have, you know, uh, access of the data on the cloud. And that, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, Gamzee, this is not like, you know, um, like a, getting a data set down from NIH. What you're doing is you're being included on the eMERGE IRB, you're part of the eMERGE team, you'll put forward a concept sheet. That is an invitation for who from the eMERGE network would like to participate in this study, which is a good thing, but you'll be gathering people from around the country, from other eMERGE sites who wanna be part of this. They may have requests and how this research gets done. There'll be co-authors on the paper. So it's not like I'm getting a, a data set, you know, I'm, I'm joining eMERGE in effect. I see, I see, I understand. No, th thank you, that's very helpful. I, and one last question is, I'm sorry, I don't wanna take all the time, but I'm really interested. No worries. Uh, the one last question is that the, the patient IDs for the EMR and the genotype data, they are the same, right? We don't need to do any matching. No, they're not the same. So essentially those are de-identified. So the, the, the ID assigned in the eMERGE, those are basically an ID assigned by the network. It's like, not like the you know, medical record state uh, IDs. But, but then you know whose genotype belongs to which phenotype, right? I mean, otherwise you can't do anything. Oh yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So essentially, you know, if we can go back to the previous slides, you know, um, this VCF files contains the same ID as this you know, common data variables and uh, you know, phenotype case controls data. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I will have a lot more questions later for everyone, but thank you so oh, much. Oh, sure. Of course. And I see uh, Ahmed. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, so I had a question actually related to something uh, you spoke about earlier. So with the whole genome sequencing, the, and there's, I think, about 2,000 patients, correct, um, mm -hmm. uh, at Columbia. Is that like a cohort of patients with a specific disease, or like how, how do you select the 2,000? So I think you talk about this. Oh, okay. Uh, which one? Yeah. yeah. You talk whole exome sequencing uh, or whole genome sequencing? Yeah, uh, which one? Uh, either one of them. Just like, you know, for example, Columbia's whole exome sequencing, okay. the 3,000 okay. patients, how are they selected? Right. So this, this are actually selected from another study, uh, which, you know, I guess, you know, in order to join the eMERGE, you have to donate some data sets, you know, as a, as a PI or, you know, whatever. So basically, I can speak for the uh, whole exon sequencing collected at Columbia. This is uh, pediatric uh, cardiovascular disease data. So it's collected for specific diseases. That's helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so if we don't have more questions, I think we can continue here. Oops. Sorry, too many animations. Uh, so now I'm going to, uh, switch the gear, talk about the eMERGE 4 study. So the primary goal of the eMERGE 4 study is to answer the question, 
That is how does a genome inform the risk assessment can impact the clinical actions taken by providers to manage risk and the propensity of participants to develop a disease. So essentially we are going to prospectively recruit 25,000 participants. Uh, we will develop this JIRA calculation to uh, identify high risk patients and the not high risk patients. And then there are two different tasks. One is high risk patients and another is not high risk paths. Together, uh, we are going to answer the following questions. Uh, one primary outcomes and two secondary outcomes. We hypothesis, you know, in the, among those high risk participants, uh, there are gonna be more action, health actions gonna be take and uh, with more newly diagnosed conditions. Uh, and also we'll have, you know, more risk reduction interventions being performed after this high risk GR return. So in order to achieve these primary aims, uh, there are some specific aims. One is to retrospectively uh, validate some PRS, which I will describe later, uh, which is an important component, risk component of this JIRA. So together with other uh, clinical risk factors, uh, this PRS will you know, help establish this genome informed risk assessment or JIRA. So once we have this JIRA calculation available, uh, we want to always, you know, again, implementation is an important keyword in the eMERGE to implement a clinical workflow to return and communicate those JIRA risks. So once we have all those algorithm infrastructure available, we're going to recruit patients, do genotyping for a diverse cohort. So finally, we can assess the uptake of risk reductions and assess the impact of uh, related clinical outcomes. So what is JIRA? Uh, there's many components actually involved in this JIRA. So one, uh, some metro same, this is a monogenic risk, which it came from the sequencing reports. Uh, those are high penetrance variants, for example, BRAC2, right? Uh, the variants on BRAC2, and these are the monogenic findings, which you know, essentially are high penetrance. But another part uh, specifically we want to uh, investigate in this study, Called, it's called PRS, polygenic risk. Uh, unlike monogenic, as the name suggested, PRS is a combined risk, uh, combined score from many low risk alleles. A polygenic score uh, looks at all of these small impact risk in, uh, variants, you know, instead of looking at those high penetrance variants. Uh, and you know, by combining all those low risk variants together, we want to estimate a person risk for a certain disease. The uh, next part is family history, right? So if your mom diagnosed with cancer, you're likely to diagnose with cancer, this family health risk. Also, we have the clinical risk, you know, alcohol assumption, BMI, lifestyles, you know. Combine all those components together, we get this genome informed risk assessment. So the important part or special part about this eMERGE study is polygenic risk school. Uh, the right-hand side figure uh, is a guideline published by Xing Wang on 2020, showing the uh, basically a, a pipeline or guideline to develop PRS. Usually it involve, involves two parts. One is called base data and another is called target data. So for base data, you only you don't need the individual level data. What you only need is the summary statistics. Uh, that that is uh you know betas obtained from the GWAS study or effect size you know obtained for the GWAS study for the variants. And you know the target data, which is uh, individual level data, uh, ideally it should be similar to your you know target your uh, the, the population where you want to apply this PRS to. And it will help you to inform the LD structure and it will help you to develop and uh, do the PRS calculation. There's a few ways you, know, you can calculate PRS after QC. One is you can simply sum all those betas together. You get an unadjusted raw PRS. You, know, you get betas, you sum them together, you get a PRS, which is quite you know, brute, brute force, very simple. But, Another thing, you know, considering there's many LD blocks in the genome, so two variants, they will associate it strongly with, it, uh, with each other, right? And uh, you don't want to add them twice because they essentially they are the same. They share the same information. 
if you add them twice, basically you add the redundant information twice. So by using this so-called C plus T methods, you first you know, do the clumping or proving that is remove those uh, or only pick one variance in the LD block that is highly associated uh, variance, only pick one uh, as a representative. And then you, know, you add them together you know, to get your score. And for sure, you can using different methods using a uh, beta shrinkage, L1, L2 penalty, uh, like lasso reach. And also uh, you, you can use the p-value threshold to only select those p-values, you know, obtaining the beta base data uh, to, to, do, uh, to calculate the PRS. That will reduce to a reduced model of the PRS. Uh, so you don't need all the betas. You only have some selected beta in your model. So the third approach uh, is not, you know, to select those betas. So you are going to, instead of using the beta estimates obtained from the base data, you first put a prior uh, on that, those betas. And then uh, you can, you know, using the observed base beta, uh, beta from the base data summary statistics to estimate a posterior mean for those beta uh, by considering the correlation structure among those variants. So you have that big matrix of the variance, which is the cor correlation uh, uh, structure. So you take that into consideration and model this beta specifically, you get a posterior, uh, posterior mean uh, estimation for this beta. Then you type them together, you will get this PRS, uh, which is the Bayesian way. Uh, so for now, uh, I think Bayesian way is becoming more and more mainstream, although the, you know, the implementation the work is, is tough. Uh, there are still many uh, that are popular using the C, C plus T in, in many cases, but uh, usually Bayesian approach will yield a, a more accurate result. So when we talk about the risk, it is not an overall risk. It is a risk specific to a disease. Uh, for eMERGE 4, this cycle of eMERGE picked 10 conditions and uh, we have the aim to estimate PRS for each of them. Uh, there are different numbers of SNPs available uh, for different conditions because you know the PRS naturally is developed differently for different conditions. Uh, some of those conditions have already have the PRS developed. So it is easy. We're just using those validated developed PRS. But for some conditions, uh, we have to optimize the PRS and also develop the PRS specifically for this eMERS project. Uh, ideally, we want to have a G1 study uh, combined by multi ancestry data to generate a, you know, a trans ancestry PRS. But unfortunately, because G1 data is just you know, spires to the European population, so most of the PRS currently, uh, they are developed based on the European ancestry. And also we want to uh, return the data uh, to some of the condition we want to return the you know, uh, PRS data to the pediatrician population, for example, asthma, but some of them we don't want, for example, breast cancer. You don't want to get a, you know, breast cancer risk when you are five, five years old, right? So that's differently uh, strategies implemented for different conditions in the eMERGE, which make this study, you know, kind of very complicated here. Uh, this is a study led by uh, me and NER on 2021. So we, use the eMERGE 3 data set to validate the three, uh, seven previously developed PRS scores for breast cancer. And because eMERGE 3 uh, can, data set, again, like just like any other you know, cohorts contains much more European population, you will see the confident interval for this European population uh, uh, ancestry is smaller, much smaller than the uh, uh, you know, uh, Latinx and African ancestry. And also uh, the performance is better. And also another thing we observed is, you know, the top three uh, PRS, those are developed based on a large European based GWAS studies. And the, the following four, the bottom four, they are actually developed specifically use a much smaller GWAS study uh, based on African or Latinx ancestry. So when those, you know, uh, PRS applied to the African or Latin ancestry. So interestingly, we, we find, okay, the performance is better actually using European based uh, GWAS studies, uh, you know, those PRS based on the European ancestry stu uh, GWAS studies. The reason we, we think is, you know, because 
GWAS typically requires large, much larger samples. So those European samples, you know, have much larger, much, much larger sample size, which give a much better beta estimate in this case, which eventually, even though, you know, it is applied to a different ancestry, it still yields a better performance than, you know, those uh, with uh, PRS developed in, uh, you know, much less sample size. Uh, this is a similar study uh, published by Ozen on 2020, you know, trying to validate PRS in CHD, pretty similar results. It works well in uh, European ancestry and uh, pretty good in Hispanic, but not as well in the African American ancestry. Uh, this is another study published by Atlas Kahan at Columbia with uh, uh, Christoph. So this recently accepted by Natural Nature Medicine. Uh, in, as, unlike the previous two, this PRS uh, is you know novelly developed uh, using UK biobank data set here. And besides uh, you know using UK biobank bank, bank data set to develop this PRS, uh, some further optimization has been added for the African ancestry by adding this APO1, uh, which is a African specific uh, genotype allele. But unfortunately, you may not be see this very clearly. Uh, even though we have optimized this specifically for the African ancestry, the performance is not is not is still not ideal. You know, for the African ancestry, we can see the performance is still better in Af uh, European in Latinx. So uh, we see PRS performs differently uh, across different ancestry, but another even bigger important is when you trying to implement this PRS, when you try to return this PRS, you know, usually you return the top 5% of the PRS as the high risk to the individuals. You realize, okay, those are not aligned well, those curves. That's the uh, distribution of the PRS across different ancestries. They don't align well. So broad developed uh, ancestry adjustment approach. Essentially what you did is you do a Cisco adjustment within each group. So you will have this, you know, adjustment, uh, raw data minus the ancestry specific mean and ancestry specific variance. And you get this PC informed ancestry mean, uh, which, you know, the alpha and the beta can be uh, estimated ahead of time using a reference panel. So after the adjustment, you will get this curve aligned much nicely. So uh, using this approach, Broad will implement this PRS reports. Uh, using all of us data as a reference panel uh, to, to generate this ancestry adjustment. Uh, the right-hand side is the uh, uh, proposed PRS report, how it looks like. Uh, so besides the PRS, another component of this JIRA is the monogenic report, which including a sequencing result from a commercial lab uh, in Vitae, which is going to sequence uh, genes in CDC Taiwan and a list of genes recommended by CARE uh, working group. So one thing different from the uh, PRS data is, you know, this uh, monogenic re report will have the HL7 message available because, you know, typically monogenic is more mature uh, in terms of the, you know, development part. So you can order this directly through the EHR if you have the interface available and you can also return the data, you know, results of, as a HL7 message. Uh, another thing we are going to collect is the family history. We are going to using Michi, which is a software smart app developed by uh, Duke. So we'll collect the family history within this uh, smart app. So there are also other clinical risks we are going to collect either from baseline survey or extracted from the EHR. Those are clinical risks. So combine everything together, we get this big uh, GRA report, which you know, uh, essentially on the first page will contain the summary of the findings, uh, whether the patient is high risk or not. And if the patient is high risk, we, it is high risk for which disease? And we also have this uh, provider facing language uh, to, to, to inform the provider what is the healthcare recommendations for this specific disease. Uh, this is, uh, you know, condition specific results for this JIRA following the, Summary, summary details. One for each high-risk condition uh, consists of many different blocks, uh, PRS, monogenic, family history, and the clinicals. For some conditions, for example, breast cancer and CHD, uh, we have advanced ways uh, to calculate uh, integrated 
risk school. That is by combining you know, all things together, including risk factors to get a risk estimation. But for some diseases, we don't have that um, you know, uh, risk calculation equation or you know, a program available. So we are going to develop this kind of visualization table to facilitate the understanding and uh, you know, uh, education the provider and the participants. So we also have the patient education page, um, including method and limitations. So altogether, they are going to you know, consider this giant JIRA report. We are going to return this JIRA back to the participants. Uh, again, this uh, EHR study, uh, this image, which always related to EHR integration, uh, which can be viewed in many aspects in the recruitment. Uh, sometimes we'll use the patient portal to do the you know, uh, EHR your patient recruit. And for the information collection, we can order tests through the EHR. We can uh, you know, launch the MICHI to collect the data from the EHR. Of course, the most important part is return of the results using the EHR. Uh, that is, you know, we are going to upload the results into EHR, either as a PDF in the media tab or you know, for the advanced part, we can have the HL7 message or other file standard integrated into the EHR. Uh, this is just an overview of the Columbia EHRI uh, plan. We start from, you know, this is very complicated. We start from uh, recruit. So we have this red cap uh, available, uh, which is a local red cap. We're going to communicate with R4 hosted at Vanderbilt. We collect the uh, recruit uh, uh, participants information from the EHR. And then participants will fill the consent and the survey on the R4 portal and also Michi, uh, and our rec app will in charge of sending out uh, invitations and reminders to the participants to, to check the participants. And then, uh, you know, we will have the uh, DNA samples collected and shipped to the two vendors, Broad and the Invite. These two vendors will create the PRS report and dump them into the R4 portal. And we here will also extract the clinical variables uh, from the EHR for the participants and send them to the R4 portal. And we think this R4 portal, uh, a report will be generated. Essentially, this report will then later uh, return back to the EHR. Uh, hopefully, it can help to trigger some CDS clinical decision support. So the last part, uh, we are going to do the recruitment. Uh, one thing very specific for this image is we want to increase the diversity, as we already know, you know, the GWAS, previous GWAS, or a lot of GWAS is biased towards the European. So we are going to recruit more diverse ancestry in this image uh, for projects, and we are going to recruit 25,000 and 2,500 each in each uh, each in each clinical site. And here at Columbia, we are going to recruit 50% of Hispanic and Latino populations. Uh, one thing is our recruitment is going to focus mainly on the primary care clinic, clinics uh, because we want to assess the uptake of those participants and their providers after those risks were returned. Uh, we already started our recruitment uh, months ago. Uh, hopefully after the next two years, we are going to recruit 2,500. So, uh, you know, this is the recruitment site uh, uh, fly and uh, please scan the QR code to, you know, join the study. Uh, one criteria, you know, in order to join the study is you have to be a Columbia and NYP, NYP, NYP patient because, you know, we need the EHR record available for you to check the uh, outcome, check the phenotyping, you know, and also other clinical variables for the GRI generation. So that's all for my presentation. I think I talked too much. Uh, now it's 1.55. We still have five minutes left. I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Go ahead. Um, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, so you talked a lot about like the risk of alk like um, um, the risk of like uh, onset of disease, but like, are you doing any studies like related to like treatment outcomes stuff like that? Like, do you use other aspects of the EHR or is it just phenotyping? Uh, so for now it's just phenotyping, but like I said, eMERGE is a you know, very large network study. If you are interested in that part, feel free to propose that one as a concept sheet, right? And uh, uh, the, the worst case is at Columbia, we can always start as a pilot study without collecting all the network data. But uh, you know, if other sites feel, okay, this is a relevant question and we want to pursue that, you know, for sure, others will join and uh, collect the data. Cool, thank you. 
Anna? Yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. <clears throat> My question is that, um, so some of the data has been mapped to AMOP common data model, right? But this is, right. this is, this only concerns CHRs. It doesn't really concern genetic data, right? So are there any plans on developing standards to convert genetic data into AMOP? Super good questions. I think, you know, uh, I know there's a, ongoing efforts on OBAP Odyssey community that is to develop a common data model for the genetics. But, uh, you know, uh, but my understanding here is for genomic data, genomic data itself is already standardized. You know, if you want, to, if we are talking about a raw data set, it's already standardized as a BCF file, right? So this is something already standardized, um, unlike the phenotyping data. But uh, if we are talking about high level, you know, we don't talk about 1.5 tagbits, that's too large, right? We talk about some abstract level. Uh, that is something we, we we haven't actually you know developed a genetic common data model, which is easier to access. We don't need to really look into those raw data sets. But that's very good, and uh, I don't think there's an effort right now. Uh, uh, but there's an effort uh, in terms of developing the uh, you know uh, HL7 message or fire standard uh, in terms of the genomic components. Can I uh, ask I th something, Kong? Oh, go that, ahead. Yeah, so there's actually, in, in genomic community also, there's an effort, there's a group called Future of VCF because mm -hmm. of, because the VCF is, uh, because it's a flat file, it can get really, really large. So that, uh, there is a there is some work, and including in my lab, actually, we are working on, you know, how to represent these LDs in a more complex format. And we are also interested in, you know, common data formats, genetics with the EHR. So if there's anyone who is interested in that and who would like to discuss with me, I would be more than happy to collaborate on that. Great. Uh, Nick, do you have questions? I thought you all raised your hand, but uh, somehow. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, um, <clears throat> could you tell us a little bit how eMERGE is thinking about its role now that all of us is here and getting bigger, um, like what is the the niche role that eMERGE can play in this new kind of more data rich environment? Well, I, I think okay, this is a tough and dangerous question. Uh, if I spoke that wrong, you know, George is going to fire me. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to speak. That's my understanding. I think you know, you know, we have all of us and all those much bigger projects, but. Still, eMERGE talk about a lot of clinical implementation, right? So when we when we talk about clinical implementation, that's always messy because you really jump out of the research, you dive into the clinical parts. Then you know there's something unexpected. For example, when we talk about this kind of return of the uh, results, EHR integration, all sites have different plans. It's just so difficult to standardize, and you know all sites have different regulations. So in that case, eMERGE itself served like a very good knowledge playground, you know, to play, play, play with those implementation parts. Maybe some parts we can, you know, uh, integrate it, we can standardize. Maybe some, some part we just don't have the, you know, standardization, we just cannot come to the conclusion or agreement across different sites. So I think, you know, essentially eMERGE hopefully can provide a, you know, foundation or some standards and so to, to share some lessons to other much bigger, you know, projects. That's my understanding. But uh, if that's wrong, George and Chunghua can definitely, you know, add. I, I mean, eMERGE is these academic medical centers working together, say in, e, in four, in phase four, to return the results. All of us, the academic centers send data there. And there's someone over there who's returning results to um, patients, I don't know, this, this one's more of a uh, research of an experiment. How would you best return results? What goes right? What goes wrong? All of us sees it a little bit more as a service and then produces this database, which researchers can get to. Like all of us is more about sharing the data and a little bit on returning results to get people to share their data with us. Emerge is studying how you send results back. Any other questions? Uh, I didn't see people raising hands.
If not, I think everyone can scan this QR code. I would like to see if this talk will significantly increase the recruitment rate for the next few weeks. <laughs> Just a little experiment here. All right. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. This is our, our last seminar. We'll see you in the fall. Uh, great seeing your faces. Hopefully we'll be in person, but uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great summer. Bye.